Well, thank you for the opportunity to discuss this paper. Uh, I thought it was a very interesting paper and uh, it was a pleasure to read. Uh, so I'll just jump right into it. Uh, so what's the research question here? Um, the question is how important is heterogeneity in explaining the monthly consumption response uh, to labor income shocks? And unsurprisingly, uh, the answer is uh, very important. Um, so the authors find that responses vary by uh, many dimensions. So for example, income shock sign, um, whether you have a positive or a negative shock, also the income shock type, um, whether you, it's a permanent or a transitory shock, um, also the consumption type, so whether it's uh, non-durable, semi-durable, and durable, and lastly, um, wealth levels, so whether it's low or high. So I think these are really um, important findings. Um, I would actually say the, the contribution um, is not really these results, but really formalizing um, the, t the taxonomy of the income shocks for account data. So um, obviously this is a useful application, but um, the main contribution here would be the, the generalizing framework. Uh, so as I mentioned, I'll just make a couple of big picture comments. So as I mentioned, um, I think this paper makes um, an important contribution to sort of the standardization of income shocks in account data. Uh, so there are a lot of other papers that use account data, but typically they look at um, specific episodes. Uh, and so it's kind of hard to compare them across different papers. Uh, so obviously there are kind of pros and cons of this general approach, so I'll go through um, and talk about that. So I think the main pro um, is that this approach kind of takes an objective view to identifying shocks. Um, and once you do that, you can apply this method to other data sets of account data, you know, this similar type of spending data, and you can compare the results. So I think it would be interesting to sort of uh, perhaps take this method, apply it to uh, different countries that use different data sets um, using this account data and see if you can find similar results. Um, I'm talking more about sort of general qualitative results, so whether you have uh, sort of similar uh, responses to say negative shocks or positive shocks. Um, obviously there are some drawbacks here. Um, you know, this is one of the few papers that actually take this approach, so there must be you know, some reason why other people haven't done it. Um, I would say one drawback is that you need to rely a bit more on these assumptions. Um, so you have to make some assumptions about you know, the distribution, these cutoffs. You have to also calibrate these cutoffs, so the author talks about that. Um, the other issue is it's harder to address endogeneity, right? So when you have, uh, if you look at a specific case, you can sort of build a case and say, oh, this is plausibly exogenous. But if you're just looking at these different um, income shocks, it's harder to know whether it's endogenous or exogenous. Um, but with that said, I, I definitely think there's um, a surplus of event studies and there's a deficit of you know, a paper that tries to generalize the framework. So I, I do think that this is an important contribution um, and there's definitely um, space for this paper. Uh, so just to harp on that point, um, you're not really supposed to read this figure, but uh, this is a summary of um, a bunch of studies that looked at the consumption response to the COVID-19 uh, stimulus in the US. And here it's about 10 papers, and I highlight six papers that use account data. So you can just see how prevalent this type of data is now using this account data because it's a lot more granular. Um, and you can also look at the different consumption types. But that, as you can see, you know, there's, there's definitely a surplus of papers that uh, study just one um, event, right? And so I would say that's the benefit of this study is sort of having this more um, general framework. Um, so I'll just give some big picture comments. I think the most surprising thing to me was sort of the asymmetric response to income shocks. Um, so the authors find that individuals uh, respond more to a positive income shock than a negative income shock. So it was just surprising to me because I've been reading this literature that inc includes sort of chrysalis and uh, Fuster Kaplan's afar, and they kind of find the opposite, which is there's a larger consumption response to um, hypothetical negative income shocks. Um, but that's not to say there aren't other papers that find similar findings. So um, there's also Bo et al. Um, they find spending increases with a tax refund, but there's little response to a tax payment, right? So that's not uh, completely identical. So a tax payment is not exactly a negative income shock, but you can see how uh, they're similar. Um, so how can we reconcile the results? I think it would be nice if the authors can sort of um, just touch upon this a little bit. 
Uh, so one thing is that um, so Chrysalis et al. and Fuster, Kaplan, and Zafar look at survey data. Um, this paper and Bo et al. use account data. So perhaps there's a difference between what people say they're going to do um, and what, the, what they actually do, because also Chrysalis and Fuster, Kaplan, and Zafar, those are hypothetical uh, shocks. Um, in terms of the theory, so you can, you can really rationalize it both ways, right? So um, Chrysalis et al. and Fuster, Kaplan, and Zafar, they kind of say uh, the, the larger reaction to a negative income shock comes from either liquidity constraints or, um, say, precautionary savings models. So if you're, if you're against a hard constraint and you get a negative income shock, you really have no choice. You have to cut back your spending. So that's why you might see that big drop. Um, alternatively, if you have a lot of um, if you, a high precautionary savings motive, you might, might want to keep a buffer, so you'll also cut back on spending. So that's how you would rationalize um, this bigger response to negative income shock. Um, you can also um, rationalize these positive, um, or the, the bigger reactions to a positive income shock. So in the paper, the author talks about habit persistence. So you get accustomed to a certain type of spending, and so when you get a positive shock, you want to spend more. If you get a negative shock, then you'll, you'll try um, as hard as you can to not cut back. Um, in Bo et al., they also mention mental accounting. So if you get um, a tax refund, then this is kind of celebratory, so you want to go out and spend it, whereas if you have to make a tax payment, then you'll kind of reshuffle your finances so you don't have to cut back. Um, so uh, I think it'd be interesting to, to discuss um, sort of the different results in the literature and, and how um, this paper ties into that. Um, another uh, sort of suggestion is, can you also look at the persistence of consumption responses? So the authors do a good job in, in kind of identifying positive versus, or sorry, um, temporary versus permanent income shocks, but you would imagine that uh, the consumption response to the, those shocks would be very different. Um, and so you can look at, um, from a consumption standpoint, whether the consumption response is more temporary or permanent. And that could be another way to sort of um, check whether uh, the taxonomy is working. Um, one more technical point, so as I understand it, the authors don't directly observe uh, credit card spending data, but they kind of observe the payment to the credit card on the checking account. Um, but at least in the US, if you're borrowing on your credit card or you're paying it off, there's gonna be a mismatch there. Uh, so if I'm spending a lot on my credit card, but I'm not paying it off, I'm just making the minimum payment, then that'll underreport my spending um, so it'll look like I'm responding less to the actual shock. So um, I don't know in the data how important the borrowing or um, paying off of credit cards is, but that could um, perhaps cause a mismatch. Also, there's going to be a month lag if uh, there is a grace period, right? So if you're spending uh, on your credit card and then the, the next month you pay it off, there's going to be this month lag. And since everything's at the monthly level, um, I don't know how that's going to impact the results if there is this lag. Um, the last thing I'll say is um, maybe the authors can discuss endogeneity a little bit. So how, how can you deal with endogeneity? For example, um, I might work harder because I want to consume more, right? So then I'll see um, an increase of spending, but also uh, what they call um, a positive income shock. So uh, I'm not quite sure how that would affect the results, but it'd be interesting to um, see a response to that. Uh, so I'm not going to go through this. This is just for the authors to look at later, just kind of minor comments and questions. Um, I'll just wrap up. So uh, to conclude, um, in general, when, when we're talking about account data, I think there are many um, studies that use uh, these type of transactions data for specific event studies, but fewer papers um, that tried to generalize the taxonomy of income shock. So I think that that's sort of the main contribution of the paper. I think it's pushing um, the literature in the right direction. So I think it's, um, it's definitely a positive contribution. Um, I would say in terms of the next steps, um, it's, it's nice to have you know, an accounting of how consumption responds to this heterogeneity. Um, but it'd be also nice to see um, uh, more accounting of, or more understanding of what's driving that heterogeneity, so perhaps um, a model that can rationalize all the results. So this paper has a lot of different dimensions of heterogeneity, so if you, um, if you test that against a model, 
you'll have a lot more degrees of freedom to sort of rule out different models, or perhaps you would need um, a combination of different models. Um, but, but essentially putting a little bit more of sort of a theoretical framework on analyzing the results I think would be helpful. Um, but otherwise, yeah, it was a really great paper, very thought-provoking, and um, I think a good contribution to literature. So thank you.